Mingala Barkam Ya and welcome back. We are joined once again by Samai Deng Tung Din. Hello. Oh, that's nice. And uh, Shun Lei is joining us in the flesh this time. Shun Lei. Hi. Yeah. The um, Din Dang Bunker. In the Din Dang Bunker. <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly. Um, so having been swayed by all of the Ang Sang Su Chi loving commenters on our Twitter, we decided we would do an apology. Um, all praise to mother. Um, should I cut that? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, today we're talking about the the coup itself and, uh, well, we already did an episode on the coup, didn't we? So we're doing post-coup, the current insurgency, the current revolution, whatever you want to call it. Um, so I think a good place to start would be, uh, Shun Lei, maybe like, you could tell us like on the ground in Yangon what the coup was actually like for you. Well, um... So on the 1st of February, it seems a bit normal, if I remembered correctly. And then I remember having discussions with diff- like friends and other activist uh, people. We all were, I think, a bit shocked and also... Oh, you mean on the day of the coup, it like felt normal? Yeah. How's that? Like- it's because like the telephone lines are cut off mm. and there were no internet I mean well people knew that they found out that there has been a coup but it's not like uh, we saw soldiers and police you right. know right away on the streets it's not like that it's, mm. it was just like a normal yeah Monday morning and um, so we discussed uh, with uh, other friends like what should we do now and I think for a few days in February we were a bit paralyzed mm. shell shocked a bit or something or? yeah it was it was more like oh they really did stage a coup <laughs> it was more like that mm. I mean we heard rumors before the coup there might be a coup because me online he was saying you know yeah there might be something like but yeah we never think they're gonna do that mm. but so it was strange feeling and also even now, what now, into eight months, nine months, something mm. like that, it still feels surreal, <laughs> to be honest. Um, so did you join the, did you, did you organize any of the protests at the beginning? Were you involved in that? Like, not deeply into organizing, but somehow to some extent, mm-hmm. uh, with some students. And I'm more like helping them with, you know, getting everything done or, yeah, I mean, like staying behind mm-hmm. and then getting everything they need. If they need like transportation, right. then... More like a coordinator. Yeah. Okay. And if they need something on the ground, like waters or food mm. or, yeah, more like that. And then finding safe houses yeah. after the protest. Yeah, that was more of like what I was doing in the first few weeks. And sorry, I mean, I remember at the beginning as well, it wasn't just students, there were a lot of uh, union groups, workers' unions. So the students, they organized together with the workers, Mm. labor unions, because the labor unions are the most politically mobilized groups in Burma. So the students, um, some students' union, they, well, they're active, but they don't really have lots of people. So they had to, I mean, work together with the labor unions. Yeah. And I remembered, like, I think around 3rd or 4th of February, the factory workers were already right, angry, right? So, mm. so yeah, um, I, on the street, I think I joined, like, a few protests. And at that time, it was also a strange feeling because it was so intense as well because we witnessed what happened in 88. Yeah. So everyone, I think, who went out on the street during like these days, like they know that they might not be able to make back home. 
Yeah, I mean, in those, it did take a while though until the police started firing live rounds, right? It didn't happen straight away. It didn't happen straight away. That's right. And so for the first, I think, few, maybe two weeks, three weeks in February, it was more, yeah, like the energy was really strong, and there were lots of people after these labor unions mm. got on the street, right? So they kind of like catalyzed the later. Uh, massive uh, street demonstrations on yeah. Um, also, I just want to quickly mention as well the civil disobedience movement, which was a way of protesting outside of going on the street, right? So like uh, not paying your taxes, um, st- like uh, government workers going on strike. Yeah. Um, what what else was in the civil disobedience movement? Oh, uh, not even government civil servants, but also like these private banks. They right. also, they also, I think, joined the C. Yeah, they wow. also joined the CDM movement as well. So Bank like, solidarity. <laughs> <laughs> it's strange, right? Yeah. It's weird, given the fact that, like in Burma, all of the banks are like these crony yeah. businessmen who are related to military. Mm. But yeah, so I remember some private banks. Uh, the employees they started joining the CDM as well. And the, like all sort of like these government uh, services, right? Like don't pay your tax or don't pay for your like water, mm. electricity bill, you know, stuff like that. I think not only the street protests, but also together with the CDM, all the like school teachers and yeah. everyone. So it was, it was a bit weird and it was a bit strange and also yeah, it's. It's, it was strange time, and stay. It is a strange time to talk about these. So you had all of these different groups involved in the protests, as you were saying. The majority mm-hmm. of them coming from the labor unions, um, but uh, and then how did the protests sort of start to turn deadly? Because we, you know, we all saw videos of people training with like the riot shields, like protesters mm-hmm. training, right? And that was like quite exciting to see. But then I feel that. That period of the protest didn't last so long because things got very serious very quickly, right? So I remember, I think in the last week of February, they started like cracking down like brutally, and they started shoot like shooting people with real bullet, and that's I think that's when like there is this girl, I think this university student. 19 years old university student yeah. uh, in Nebido. Uh, she was shot. Uh, it was a headshot. And so that's where everything started like getting serious, like really brutally cracked down on the protester. And then first it was police or I think <laughs> it is police because they all were in police uniform. And I think started from like March, there there were soldiers as well. So not only police, um, but also soldiers uh, from these like very aggressive offensive battalions, you know, who were famous for committing these massacre in uh, Rakhine State in back in twenty seventeen. You know, like battalion what seventy seven or you know these like light infantry yeah division. These 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 people like these these soldiers. So they started uh, appearing in different cities and different places, and then they just yeah. Um, um, could, could I just quickly interject? Like, how how did the protesters react to that? You know, because there were still people going out on the streets, right? So. One thing started got like very serious, and it it was like a war zone out there, right? When they started shooting people, arresting people aggressively, so protesters they were they were using different strategies on the ground, right? So they built like own barricades with like some bags, and you know with like these trash bin or you know different kinds of yeah uh, barricades to protect themselves or even to delay like you know so that the soldiers and police will come and get them in a sec like within seconds or and then they used these like shield yeah I remember um this. though they are not bulletproof shield but at least you know somehow you got something and then 
Um, they also used, I think, some fireworks as well. Yeah. Yeah. And so these kind of different things, I think, also because, well, I was in Yangon at that time, so I can only say it from Yangon experience. So most people on the street, like not only most people, but most are like young people, right? So they use internet, mm. and then I think they like they search different ways of like these tactics they even use like molotov cocktails and everyone was like oh we need to you know we need to use different methods and you know how to fire back them or yeah like they use slingshots and, you know these different uh weapons right uh more like self-defense weapons to protect themselves so and then they're gonna be like a frontline protester well, mostly men <laughs> yeah. and yeah they would be like fully pro- like they would wear fully protective like gears and with shoes and they have like all these Molotov cocktails in their hands and all these fireworks like that and then there's gonna be like second like first line second line and then there were like medical units at the end of the protest group so it was very well so coordinated it's like, yeah, yeah it was pretty impressive it, it sounds like you know, the, the brainchild of the art of war and the anarchist cookbook sort of came together and decided to do a thing. Um, th- that's just been going through my mind. Sorry, that wasn't productive. <laughs> no, 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 that's true. I remembered everyone's sharing also, I think, from that book or some, like, some people <laughs> translated like something and then they started sharing on Facebook and you know so like for example how to make Molotov cocktails and you know yeah all yeah. these kind of thing in Burmese uh, language and it has been like on social media yeah so yeah um, I was also curious about like how what happened with like the politicization of these people because there is that kind of idea of struggle against authority or a common enemy or something like radicalizes people um creates this kind of comradeship um in what way was that kind of directed what or like how much were people also politicizing during this process so street protests okay they were really powerful strong and then like well coordinated like you said but also there's another part which I personally think that um, I think um, it was more like a reactionary response okay. to daily disruption. Like, I don't know, like, it. I feel like, okay, we got disrupted, right? So we won't have our daily life before February. So... It was more like this immediate reactionary response to that. And then, of course, when they started shooting us, then, okay, we need this, like, coordinated, you know, force you know, to fight back. Till that, like, I don't really see the political mm. <laughs> vision, like, big vision, right? Because I remember even, like, in March, somewhere, like, mid, like mid-state, like, mid-March, we still have to convince people about like, to, for example, 2008 constitution. It's just a bullshit thing yeah. right? like that. But people were like, oh no, we voted like NLD or we voted Aung San Suu Kyi through this electoral process. And so like we can't throw away this or I think people are confused. I think I, I think they, they think that if they delegitimize the 2008 military drafted constitution then they would be like oh it doesn't mean like we are also delegitimizing Aung San Suu Kyi or right. NLD you know I think maybe that's how they think that's why so it that's- was so difficult like to to let into people's mind that 2008 constitution is just a shit show <laughs> so there was still an element of fealty towards NLD and Suchi, basically. Oh, very much. I mean, um, you still can see now. Yeah, yeah. In yeah. in our Twitter replies, you can see it now. <laughs> so there, there were a lot of like advocacy from the ethnic groups. Yeah, that's they what I was going to ask. Yeah, yeah, they were saying like, no, two thousand eight constitution is like military drafted constitution, and it's how military make themselves escapable 
from you know everything and so that they stay gonna have this like good looking on the world stage and everything so it was really hard for like different ethnic activists or different ethnic organizations or some like um, radical groups to really advocate on general public mm -hmm. why we need to like uh, throw away this 2008 constitution and also why we need to like forget about the whole electoral process and electoral politics system <laughs> like that's not what we are talking about like that right and also in the first like few weeks like we have to make sure like it's not only about to get like to release Aung San Suu Kyi or president or you know at that time it's more about like how we have like we can emancipate ourselves how we can liberate ourselves mm -hmm. and how it this is all about marginalized people how this is all about oppressed people not only Aung San Suu Kyi you know <laughs> not only like we are not going out on street risking our lives so that Aung San Suu Kyi like they will release Aung San Suu Kyi in fact no <laughs> you know so yeah, yeah. Um, just, just as well speaking about ethnic people, I also saw this because I, I was watching from afar, right? I wasn't there, but I could see this in real time online, like Bama people, and we've spoken about this before, so we don't need to go into too much depth, but like kind of waking up about violence towards ethnic people, which was, I mean, like, I don't want to sound patronizing, but it was almost like funny to watch them be like, oh, wait, now that I'm being shot, I know that ethnic people are being shot. And it's like, well, it took you. 50 years to realize it but um good i suppose you've come around eventually i mean how kind of widespread was that you know i got really angry when my people started talking about oh so have you heard these about these are, Rohingya? like yeah. yeah oh so these are not lines i was like what the fuck come <laughs> on <laughs> and especially i got angry when like young Burma people from like cities area where they have internet they have everything they can read i mean they're not like this illiterate i mean like yeah i don't want to use that word but yeah so they have all the resources if they want to find out they can find out it's not like something happened on a In isolated Australia, island yeah. you know far away from Burma, like all military kept all these people or keep you know massacring it's not like that so i was like what the fuck is wrong with all you <laughs> like all of you you know like that so and then yeah like oh so it took like what 70 years to figure out that the military has been the same military like they've been committing these atrocities these human rights you know crime yeah. against human rights violations to all these people in the ethnic area so it doesn't happen to you doesn't really mean it doesn't happen to these people these communities and they that yeah and also uh i said that like in yango what we've experienced of course it was brutal and it stay brutal like killing they just shot like they can shot to yeah. like you know some yeah randomly and then it it wasn't even that brutal compared to what Karen people have been experiencing. Generationally, Rohingya, yeah, as well, Rohingya yeah. people have been experiencing. It wasn't even that brutal. I mean, I'm not discounting yeah, 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 the yeah, yeah, brutality yeah, yeah, yeah. of uh, what we experience in Yangon or Mandalay or these like cities. But come on, they have been suffering this like generational trauma or this psychological nightmare, right? So it's nothing compare comparable to what ethnic people have been going through in the last 70 years. Yeah. Um, well, then it's kind of, I don't want to say ironic, but it's interesting because, you know, short, uh, shortly after the, the protest started to turn very violent, you saw a lot of the officials from the former NLD and uh, other kind of anti-Junta, we can say, groups that formed this uh, NUG, right? National Unity mm -hmm. Government in Exile. Um, hint, we're not a fan of them. But um, yeah, mostly they are in uh, Thailand and in the ethnic areas. And I think they have like offices in New York and London as well, mm -hmm. to be honest. Um, and, uh, and so with that came the PDF, which is the People's Defense Force, which is a lot of these people we've been talking about. Well, it's hard to say how many, but let's just say mm -hmm. a lot. Uh, went out to join this new People's Defense Force, which is supposedly the army of the NUG, National Unity Government. 
what you had right was this um, kind of grand irony of now a lot of these Bama people look to the ethnic people as like, oh, you can be our saviors, you can give us safe haven, you can protect us, you can teach us how to fight the Tamada, right? And I suppose there's, there's two different things to talk about here. One is the NUG and one is the PDF. Um, we spoke before about, you know, you know, well, we both know people who have gone to join the PDF or at least get training with the ethnic rebels, mm -hmm. particularly the Karen and the Kachin. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, we've heard some kind of funny stories about <laughs> what that cultural shock maybe is like. Um, so, yeah, NUG is formed. In, but I think before NUG really talk about PDF, mm. I think there, in some areas there were already like young people forming, organizing themselves yeah, to yeah. this like as a people defense force. Yeah, they they already started like fighting back like with weapons and all these like military like uh, strategy and stuff like that. So, but then when uh, well because of people wanted to do more like an urban guerrilla warfare, right? Not necessarily want to be under, I mean, minist like new ministry of defense in ASI or... Yeah. Uh, I got the impression from some young people who want to get these military training in ethnic areas. So they were like, oh yeah, we wanted to do urban guerrilla warfare, so we went to these places. But then like halfway of the training, <laughs> like they asked that to sign you know okay we are under NUG PDF or you know we had to take an oath with the NUG flag or NUG PDF flag or mm. so I think people some people got confused like we didn't agree to this or we were not fully informed I mean it's very literal co-optation isn't it so yeah and then there were already some well success stories of some PDF but then now because NUG also calling PDF, so there were a bit of a, a bit of a confusion, right? Even with the name. Yeah. What I'm afraid of is like, well, if in the end people win, then I'm afraid that NUG gonna co opt the whole revolution. Like, see, like. <laughs> Look at how we coordinated with these. Look at how we <laughs> saved the day. Yeah. yeah. And then also we have to remember that the training they received, the weapons they received, all the the support they received was all from the ethnic yeah. uh, rebels. That's true. And they don't, they did, I mean, all the NLD members, like former parliamentary members, they all were silent when Rohingya were killed. Yeah. They all were silent when Karim villages were burned down. They all were saying that one, you know, factory workers were sexually harassed in the workplace or, you know, uh, discriminated against. Yeah. Uh, and now they need thing. them to save. Yeah. Them. yeah. And they even went to these ethnic areas in the first place. One, you know, um, they they got the uh, arrest one from the military, right? So it's um, it's really depressing and also at the same time. Uh, I feel like it's totally unfair to the ethnic people. Yeah. Now that they are all after you, and now you go to the people, the community that you have been ignoring. Let's say in the last five years, when you have imp like when, when you, you have power, power, right? Yeah. When you you had power, I mean, maybe they don't, they didn't really have the total control because the military always in power, but. Let me say, somehow they can do something. Oh, I mean, they were right? completely silent. Um, they, and, yeah. and, and, you know, as well, just we mentioned it last week, but, you know, Suchi defending the Tamador at The Hague, et cetera, et cetera. So. Yeah, I mean, it's very much the... Um, I can't tell if it's a liberal or reactionary sentiment or both, but it's the, the whole sentiment of, I don't give a shit until it, like, starts affecting me type of thing. It's like um, it's like Dick Cheney's daughter being a lesbian. I don't know why that's the first thing that comes to mind um, in in this scenario, but yeah, that's that's all I see. And then the other thing I see is like, you know, it's it's an old Bond villain, and then the NUG comes back, and it's like, 
um, we need your help. And it sort of the, um, he swivels around in the chair and he goes, ah, so you've come to me. But yeah, the, the whole thing is just so based on my two abstractions of mind. It, it's so farcical. And a, a government, well, sorry, a, a group of people capable of do, doing positive change in a time where they're in power decides to try and do something when they don't have any power. Yeah, it, it, it reminds me a lot of um, actually like the Democrats in the States, you know, how they're like, oh, black women voters will save us. And it's like, oh, yeah, you've been so great to black women voters all these years, you know. Yeah, that's true. And it was re- like, it was really sad to witness that. And it is day sad because till now, I don't think they officially apologize to the ethnic people <laughs> mm. and all the oppressed groups in Burma. Um, they also did do, they're doing some identity politics, like uh, the head of the NUG supposedly is a catching guy, right? Yeah, so when they announced the NUG together with the list of the people, like the minister, the beauty minister list, so I saw... Um, a couple of the ethnic names, right? And the first thing that came in my mind at that time was, oh God, are they using ethnic people, ethnic names as a tokenism? Oh, you don't say. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I was like, oh, fuck. Like, you know, they are doing that again. Um, so you actually, you didn't join PDF, but you were one of the people. Can we talk about this? Like, what you did? Mm, what do, like, Okay, I'll just do the question, you can decide what you want to answer. So, you were one of the people who went to the ethnic areas as like a urban Bama. You went mm-hmm. to the Karen areas. C- can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah. Uh, maybe not the part, but okay. yeah. Uh, yeah, so I went to the one of the ethnic control areas. And then, uh, well, at that time, like my friends... Uh, they got arrested and also in Yango the space was getting smaller and smaller in terms of like finding safe, like safe houses and then moving around there were soldiers everywhere on the streets and there were like uh, checkpoints and also yeah I was basically nervous at that time so I was like I, w- I need to get away from Yango and you- maybe at least like for yeah. A few weeks or a few months. And you had been quite a vocal person before the coup as well, right? So you'd imagine yeah. your name is on some list somewhere. Yeah, I mean, well, I'm not that, like, high-profile activist. Mm. Uh, I intentionally, like, uh, did that in the past few years when I started, like, uh, doing my feminist activism work, right? Um, so anyway... And then I wasn't sure that because I was on some of the protests with like some labor groups and some student groups and I had like some meetings, I hosted some meetings at my place. So I wasn't sure what kind of information they have at that time. So I was like, okay, I need to get away from Yangon maybe like for a few weeks, for a few months. And then I had some, I mean, uh, friends in KNU area so I went there and then the vibe was totally different from when you had been from there before y- or from uh, Yangon n- from Yangon right because in Yangon there was a like whole like protest and everything was like a mess right like soldiers police everywhere like all and also like CDM like you know people were stay uh, encouraging other people to join the CDM who hasn't joined the CDM movement, things like that. But then when I got to this uh, KNU area, then yeah, everything was the same as I have been. Like I have been there a couple of times. That's what I was going to say as well so, to like listeners. Like you're not one of these people who suddenly needs to find safe haven with them. Like you had yeah, spent time been, with them yeah, before. A I have times. spent time with them before like yeah i've been uh, yeah i have worked with like some activities with them like with their communities so i know the area quite like well as well so but then everything was normal like like the same like before the coup one i always like went there it, it's like totally the same and there were like no cdm like no protest of course it's their own like autonomous yeah. region right autonomous area and then 
it was weird because first few days I arrived there, oh, the energy is totally different. Like their daily life seems like the same. I mean, of course not, but that's the first impression I got. And then because in Yangon, people were like uh, calling for CDM and stuff like that. And then like CDM seems like nothing for them because of course, they are not living under Burmese state government, right? And they've so, been engaged in armed struggle against yeah. the Burmese state government yeah. for 60, 70 years. Yeah. yeah. So all CDM and all the like protests and every like chance of the protest in Yango, it, it even looked like a joke to me, yeah. like, you know. And then also, I, I don't know, I got embarrassed or... <laughs> Um, because I was like, maybe at that time a bit hopeful in Yango. And then when I got there, it was like totally different, right? So I was like, ah, maybe I was, maybe all the time I was like having this false hope that maybe this time we can win. <laughs> I started thinking about, oh, maybe this was all delusional of me to think about that. You mean just via street protest? Yeah, via street protests and all these CDM movement yeah. because at that time I remembered even like some famous politicians, like older students, mm -hmm. you know, activist people, they were saying like, um, the day is near, like, you know, the day that we're going to win is coming near. Mm. And then like, we're going to win with like this CDM movement together with this like uh, at that time, I think it was more of a CRPA committee representing yeah. people's little like this um, a committee from the former MPs, right, from the NLD. And so they were like together with them and then together with the CDM movement and together with the street protest, like we're going to win, like it's very soon. But then when I got to this current village, it's totally different. You know, they they have to fight for their territory. They they have to fight for their self determination, and then all the CDM and everything. It looks like a joke for them because they don't work for any government offices. They don't work for any private sector. Yeah, so that's I think that's also how I got enlightened as well <laughs> to some extent, and then started thinking about oh, this whole thing might be like I started thinking about. Now everything is like really fucked up and like we can, I don't know, I, I thought about that we can really win. Is it like, I don't know, I, I like, maybe it's like this metaphor I was thinking about the other day, like uh, the, the kind of clouds, the clouds cleared a bit and you saw how big the mountain really is, right? Something like that. Yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah, we can use, maybe we can use that kind of metaphor. That's where I also started questioning about the Ma people um, being enlightened or <laughs> whatever, like the understanding that they got in the first, like in the past like few weeks. Oh yeah, now we understand how military mm. treated ethnic people. And I started a question about like, do they really understand about the struggles and about the oppressions that uh, ethnic people experienced or it's just they were so desperate. So, I feel like now, yeah, like, you know, KIA come and help us or KNU yeah. come and help us. Yeah, I sort of think like more of a letter mm -hmm. uh, thing. So it was, it's, uh, it's really absurd. <laughs> so you mentioned uh, all this sort of like organization at, at the hands of the, uh, the NUG. Um, what, what, what about its uh, sort of, you know, lack thereof? Um, you know, in, in reference to, uh, to, 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 for example, like, like, like DE Day. Could you walk us through, walk us through um, that? So the after NUG, like, um, walking on this like PDF and you know stuff like that, and then I noticed that on uh, Burmese social media, people started talking about DE Day, and I was like, oh, what is that? Because at some point, I stopped following news <laughs> about like Burma, and then I was like, "Oh, what? Like, what was going on? Like, what is D Day?" And then I found out that it, it was the day that the NUG called for like these coordinated attack back to military 
I don't know. It it was stupid, right? Like when I when I found out that, like, who on earth would announce the coordinated attack, like on social media, so that the I don't know the enemy can prepare. <laughs> like, oh, okay, they're gonna come, like full on, like you know, so that we have like we we yeah we can think about how to, I don't know, like. Uh, how to fight back or you know it's, it, I don't know to me it was stupid and also um, not only stupid it was also again unfair for these young people for the people like for the communities fighting on the ground without any support like any support mean like any financial support any material support and NUG people they are in exile now and with the release of one statement okay this day is d-day and then who is fighting like these young people as young as 14 years old high school boy from a village in you know the middle part of Burma or a village in up north or south or every directions of the country so it was really unfair for these people who are fighting because they know that it is like unjust, it is unfair, and they don't want to live even one second under military rule, right? That's why they took up arms, and then they are fighting. They are protecting their loved ones. They are protecting. Yeah, they are. They are basically protecting the dignity to live. But then NUG just can. They just like easily, carelessly like announce. Okay, this is D Day, and then what happened? Well. Uh, I observed that after D-Day, the military, they're even more harsh on people. Like, you know, like for example, I think in Yangon, in some townships, they raided, like, they are raiding houses every night, yeah. arresting young people who they might think like, oh, these young people might got like these trainings in the ethnic area. Now, you know, they are behind all this explosion or all this attack. So, but then, yeah. I mean, there has been, that has happened to a degree though. I mean... There are, I don't think we mentioned it yet, um, and we did a article on Dindeng about this, where we talked about it a bit, but uh, some of the PDF or people, Bama people who have gone to be trained by the ethnic rebels have gone back to the cities mm. and are doing kind of very low-level insurgency assassinations of military or attacks, it's not so many effective assassinations, but also mm. um, targeting military inf- suspected military informants and... Um, attacking uh, like infrastructure as well right so th- there definitely is this uh, low level insurgency but it didn't seem like it was very well coordinated at all with that D-Day announcement um, and as you said it, if anything it was a way for the Tamador to kind of step up their hostility towards the population and 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 as you say, there have been some unbelievably brutal reports as well, like uh, even like volunteer doctors being like tortured to death in the street, kind of thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. So and also like places like in Chinste where internet wasn't even good or accessible even before the coup, and now with the coup, everything has been like really worse, and all these communications lines like being cut off like so yeah places like these i mean it's really really like to the war zone and even at, like after the day announcement like they have been using like uh, i mean the military has been using these like big weapons like rockets or mm-hmm. you know artillery shellings on these villages burning down villages in chin state and in middle part of burma and in some other places across the country as well so and also, I feel like um, it is also unfair for these PDF uh, being criticized because using all full violence on the ground uh, from the people. I mean, like like me who are now like in safe place, right? Yeah. And from the people or from the journalists, foreign journalists, foreign media saying like... Um, it is really like is it really justifiable to use yeah. violence force i mean come on it is even for me of like i'm burmese but even for me it's not our place to judge 
or to tell people what to engage or not what to engage, right? So it's not really our... I mean, like, yeah, yeah, you get this impression it happens quite a lot with the Global South. I'll get you one sec, Samo. Um, it happens quite a lot with the Global South when, when there are protests that are violent, like the protesters being violent, that like, oh no, Western media just wants you all to stand up in a line and get shot one by one. That's what the Western media wants their, their Global South protesters to be like, you know? Yeah, I mean, of course, you each can have different individual opinions on the take of violence and non-violence tactics and etc. when it comes to revolution. But right now with the Burma case, Burma um, problem, I don't think it's really our place to tell people, especially to tell people on the ground who are not getting enough I mean, uh, recognition for what they have been through in the last eight months. I mean, think about the mental space, right? They can they, they can sleep for what? Like, they can really have a sound sleep at night for like eight months. And the whole economy has fallen down. Yeah. Everything has been so difficult. So unless, I mean, you don't go back and be with the people like, don't just talk about it. I mean, I'm also <laughs> yeah. talking about me like it's also it already being hypocritical of me. I mean, about that. at the same time as well, like, you know, these nonviolent CDM uh, actions, which are still going on, like not paying water bill, not paying electricity bill, stuff like that, that is re reinforced and only made possible by like violent action. So, for example, like I say, people aren't paying those bills. So they get it cut off, right? People mm -hmm. cut their, the the government will cut their water, cut their power. How does it get turned back on? PDF people show up at the power station or whatever mm -hmm. at the office and say, you put a gun to their head, I imagine, I'm not sure, but you know, say like, you turn this fucking back on right now. Um, and that's how people are able to protest peacefully is through that kind of defensive violence, I guess you could call it. Yeah. Um, uh, another thing, yeah, like, like you were saying, um, uh, the whole, like, the Western media wants you all to do these very, like, bold moves, like, no, if low-level sort of, um, you know, subterfuge uh, insurgency is gonna get, the, is gonna be more productive and, you know, gonna be more, uh, better at actively, like, targeting different parts of, um, the, um, the, the Tamador's, like, um, control, then that's the way to go. Uh, but if you're doing violence, then you're just as bad as a Tamadar. No! Are you telling me that an anti-anti-fascist is not a fascist? There you go. Sorry to break it to you. Damn, this is a big pain moment. But, yeah, no. Um, it, it, yeah, so you, you have to, like, um, you have to basically say, fine, we can make, you know, observations, critiques, uh, assessments here. At the end of the day, it doesn't. The, the decisions get made by the people who were there, actually, you know, doing the whole fucking shit because they're actually doing um, the, the the actual insurgency. Yes, and then that also begs the question of how much control over the PDF does the NUG even have, right? And, and the other bit is how much it should have, because frankly, you know, eh, I, he can't see it, but that's a donut in my hand. Um, yeah. So, so that actually raises a question, which is, you know, how much control does the NUG have over the PDF? And also, I mean, what is the PDF? Because certainly there are a lot of different people who maybe have some fealty towards the NUG and PDF, or maybe they're completely independent. They definitely exist as well. Um, so it's actually quite hard to know even who is fighting the state for what reasons at this point, right? Yeah, I guess the PDF, they are fighting, first of all, like to defend themselves and their communities. Yeah, their families, uh, so they're protecting themselves as well, right? If you are in that situation, what do you do, right? So, yeah, you, you choose to do what's best for you, and also, we are talking about here, like, um, dealing with the psychopaths, sociopaths, mm. who have all the advanced weapons, right? They have all the fighter jet planes, 
all these tanks, military tanks, and, and the, the institutions as yeah. well, like jails and yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, everything. Right, they have the whole system. So we are dealing with those psychopaths, sociopaths who have all these systems to destroy, who are capable of doing the massive destruction over communities, over. Places, over and, and, yeah. towns, and everything, right? And they have the experience and know-how. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they, they 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 exactly know what they are doing. So in that case, like, what can you tell to the people who live with, like, yeah, who who live in that situation, so right? So you're talking about the NUG, like what? In, in terms of the question, right, like how much control does or should the energy have, right? So in that case, I even energy, right? I don't think they are in the right place to tell people on the ground. Oh, you should do this coordinated attack on this day, or you shouldn't fight back. Like we should all embrace nonviolence. Like look at Gandhi. <laughs> you know, I don't think. They are in the right place to do that. But but are they even capable of doing it? Well, they still have some popular support, right? So but I mean, they did they, announce D-Day, and nothing really happened on mass, right? Well, I yeah. Also, because I guess like um, they don't. I'm not sure they even know how many PDFs out there. Yeah. Right. Even though they are claiming that the PDF are under NUG Ministry of Defense and Ministry of Defense is now like supporting the PDF or whatever. But, and also, um, I don't think they support, like they have supported them in terms of finance or, you know, I don't think so. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. So in that case, I mean, of course, there are still like some popular support because I remember like around like D Day announcement, some people like online they were saying like, oh yes, finally, and UG made D Day, and then like we're gonna win, and you know like that yeah. state this delusional <laughs> state of mind that they have. I don't know, like maybe there should be a balance to see like the the reality, right? Not the this not this delusional version that NUG has been tricking the mind of the people but we should really see the reality and if we really want to support whatever way we want to for this revolution in Burma I think we should really talk to people on the ground I, I think the other thing as well is that I think the only people like as you say the NUG probably don't know how many people are in the PDF I mean I'm certain they don't other than the Tamada, I feel like the only people who have a very clear view of what they're doing right now, it's got to be the ethnic rebels, right? And it's, it's been very interesting to see how they've approached, and all, you know, I'm talking about lots of different groups, I'm not lumping them in together, how they've approached the NUG and how they've dealt with them. So, for example, it, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, um, I'll allude to it. Like, from what I've heard from the KIO, Kitchen Independence Organization and Army, they're very apprehensive. They will publicly, you know, talk quite nicely about NUG. Oh, you know, NUG are talking about federalism. We support that, something like this. But the all the ethnic rebels, frankly, have always been extremely cautious when it comes to being on the front foot historically. And they've also been very cautious about doing urban insurgency. Almost none of them have, although some have prepared to, but it hasn't really ever happened. And also, like they, they, they are always very, very cautious of civilians being caught up in fighting. Uh, particularly the Kachin, I know for sure, are like they, they always really try and avoid that. Whereas the NUG, as you were saying, Shinlei has this kind of attitude right now regarding this revolution is just fucking throw your body at the nearest police station and hopefully that'll do it right um i feel like the the ethnic rebels are being much more level-headed much more cautious and pragmatic about it and also of course there is this power play between them and the nug as to what burma is going to look like if and when mm. the tamadar is gotten rid of um, and I think the big thing for the ethnic rebels is, 
as you alluded to again earlier, like we don't want the NUG just to take all the credit and oh, Suchi is a hero of the revolution again, you know. Um, when you talk about the ethnic rebels being more level, level-headed, it's because it's their lives, man. And, and that's the difference. It's like the, NU, uh, the, the, the government's in exile. Well, they're in exile. They can't get shot or, you know, get stabbed or get thrown in prison unless, like, I don't know, someone sends, like, an operative or whatever the hell, James Bond shit. But, yeah, this is actually people's lives, uh, so they're being more careful because they have to, because they're not expendable, except for, in the eyes of the NUG, they probably are expendable. Because if the one group of ethnic rebels doesn't figure it out, there's another one, and another one, <laughs> and another one. Um, yeah, no, I think you're right, and I think the other big question is like what happens okay maybe maybe we, maybe we should phrase it this way um do we think that this revolution is going to be successful and by that i mean will they will the tamadol be like maybe not disbanded but finished in some way or another what do you and then i guess a follow-up <laughs> question would be and then what would that look like right um because you know all of the key components for a successful revolution are there like if you've got the ingredients for a cake it's all mm-hmm. right in front of you you know um well i think in that case with the metaphor of a cake and the recipes i don't think we have all the recipes to make the cake at the moment sadly wait recipes or ingredients <laughs> or both okay or maybe. you don't think I so don't i mean if we if we just look at like <laughs> historically revolutions right you've got a vast majority of the populace who are against the current government Mm -hmm. you've got this long history of insurgency on the fringes of the country Mm -hmm. the 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 popular support of the actual tamada who have control over Mm -hmm. the mechanisms of government right now is virtually non-existent other than those who actually are tamada maybe tamada families Mm -hmm. so in that sense i mean like the ingredients are there also a lot of weapons in the country Um, yeah but What's it missing? Uh, we forget about different international actors, these organizations. You're talking about the NGOs more uh, than ING states. ingos yeah. and these, um, yeah, state, like, uh, like organization like UN and these different humanitarian actors, right? I don't think they're going to hold that long, like not engaging with the military and everything, right? I mean, I don't know from a very layman perspective, they got funding to spend on <laughs> so in the end they're going to be like oh in fact we won't wait the revolution to win or whatever we wait i don't know support with the people using violence or maybe rather we're gonna try to uh convince the tamador so that they would allow some humanitarian uh support that we come like we can support to the people on the ground and then from that point then maybe the whole this um that this whole thing gonna maybe normalized maybe I don't know. yeah I, I the one thing i would be skeptical about is just thinking in terms of capital the the ngo or ingo industry in burma was a big source of however the fuck these people like spend their money <laughs> and make money right mm-hmm. so it was very much in the because there's been an exodus of these foreign NGO workers, and I'm sure we've mentioned it on previous episodes, or people know already about you know rent prices in Yangon, mm. how they exploded because of these NGOs moving in. So just in terms of capital, I feel like it is in the NGO's interest to have their people there, and they and they are not there with the Tamador in power. But as you say, you know, if they can work out some kind of deal where they can get their people back in and kind of have some kind of relationship with the Tamador, I, I don't I don't think it would be the Tamador as the Tamador is now. I feel like the Tamador would have to go at least some aesthetic reforms before that would be acceptable for these international actors. Sure. And I in that case also I think Tamador they don't only have all these military atrocities experience, but they also have experience in how to how to present themselves in a good way. Look at like start from twenty ten, right? Like look at how they drafted this 
constitution. Uh, can I explain the... that? I don't know if people are going to know. So it's like the Tamadol were like, we're doing the graceful thing. We're ceding power to the people and the great Lady Suchi. We're the good guys here, you know, right? Something like yeah, that. Right? Yeah, right? So, okay, look at this like constitution where we invited all these different representatives in like back in one like nine. 94 93 right and then look at this is the like uh, yeah uh the constitution we have like very democratic constitution we have we invite like different parties like multi-party system right so it's like we're voluntarily ceding power in the name of progress it's kind of (laughs) Yeah. yeah Like, we're willing to change, like, you know, we're willing to accept all these democratic transition. Of course, we want to um, expand our relationship, not like not only with China, Russia, but also with the West as well. So that's how we present ourselves. So they also had that experience in we've, the last 10 years. We've been good boys. Please give us foreign capital. <laughs> right. I, I wasn't fired. I quit first. That's that's yeah, that's what it, that's what it's like. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. <laughs> they, they, I mean, so what that, if if mm. they uh, they orchestrated that scenario again with, yeah. you know, okay, 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 we're gonna stop all the violence. We're gonna stop arresting people. Like, okay, maybe we might release some, you know, an important people or the worst scenario. Okay, we're gonna release Aung <laughs> Suu <laughs> God forbid. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a, a you know what the the nationalists in our mentions are going to get so annoyed. But like oh, the one good yeah. thing the junta ever did was putting <laughs> trial for <laughs> crimes. Yeah. So yeah, yeah I might have to like, cut that. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> they would be like, oh, okay, you guys can come back for investment and everything, you know, and yeah, give us more loan, and we're gonna back to yeah what they call what flourishing democracy mm-hmm. or disciplined democracy or so you're whatever. you're pretty pessimistic yes and stay. i i would say i too am pretty pessimistic but i would also throw in like if this was successful like i kind of alluded to earlier if the tamador was defeated in a military sense i still think the outcome of that would be incredibly violent and like like following that like there's a lot of contradictions in burma which the tamador are not necessarily the ones creating right that's true and i think um another important thing we have to think about is now people are talking about we're gonna win we're gonna win right but i don't think we haven't enough like we haven't talked about enough uh, about what we're gonna do after we win exactly yeah yeah, yeah. so i guess that's very crucial part of the revolution as well okay now we win like now okay we have won like we like you know the Tamadol has defeated whatever you know the military has defeated so what kind of society we want okay like how do we treat to labor unions? How do we treat to factory workers? How do we work together with different marginalized people? What the fuck do we do about the war state army? Jesus, can you imagine? <laughs> well, that's that's another... There's a lot that's, of questions, that's, right? Yeah, yeah, that's another story, <laughs> right? So, yeah, like, how do we reconcile with not only about the material conditions and these like political vision and new possibilities but also about how do we reconcile with our own past trauma that not only the military gave to us but also the trauma that we gave to each other as well so how do we yeah how do we work out on everything like that so i don't think we talk about that enough right now yeah. now everything and everyone is focused on um d-day and yeah. then you know all the pdf people's fighting back and then like we're gonna win that's it yeah i i, I know it sounds like contradictory to what we were saying before because 
At the same time, you and I can be quite sceptical and quite pessimistic. But then, like, both of us, particularly you, we have friends and comrades who are doing in some incredible acts of heroism in the name and 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 uh, sacrifice in the name of this revolution. And I really don't want to belittle that at all. Mm-hmm. I'll cut it, but uh, thinking about, like, right? Jesus Christ, man, like... And he was always a good comrade, you know what I mean? Always active. And it's like, he knows better than we do, right? In terms of if you're actually going to, like, sacrifice your life for this revolution, yeah? And and he's done that. And so have a lot of other people. And, like, when we're talking, like, negatively maybe about the revolution, like, at the same time, I don't want to, you know, diminish their sacrifice, right? Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, I don't think that uh, that's what we meant yeah but yeah. yeah more like we should be more critical of the narratives around the revolution right now happening mm. in Burma and also we should be more focused on the people like fighting on the ground rather than listening to this delusional <laughs> NUG yeah. and some other uh political activists the or fucking 88 generation yeah. <laughs> you know right like uh, sometimes I eat not sometimes I always also question about that to myself like um, it's a hypocrite of me <laughs> I mean talking about revolution yeah. in a safe place you know where I can sip my cup of tea and, and play with the cat yeah <laughs> so yeah um Everything should come from the people fighting on the ground. Yeah. This whole revolution, the narrative of the revolution, it should come from them. Mm. You know, not from people like me. You know, not from people like those in exile. Or you know, I mean, I'm not. Also, I'm not discounting the the solidarity yeah. given us from exile and these uh, diasporic communities across the world. No, not at all. I mean, there has been a huge support from different communities across the world as well. We need that as well, but we should really listen to the people on the ground who are taking up arms and whatever they can to fight against this fascist, you know, military. Yeah. And and what like as you said, you know, what the real tragedy is bound to be is that once well, if the Tamadol is defeated militarily, it's not going to be those people who were taking up arms on the ground who have any kind of say about what the future of the country is going to be. It's going to be most likely the NUG in exile or Su Chi out of prison who yeah. um, who shapes that. Sadly. Yeah. Um, and that's, well, that's the one, okay, just to try and steer it towards one note of optimism before we end the show. And I think, like, that's why I think that, as we were saying before, the ethnic uh, army's approach is quite shrewd, is quite clever. It's, you know, let's play our cards close to our chest here. Let's not overly commit. And um, I feel like they're still in the game, right? Like, if anybody holds the power here, they're probably the most secure I right now. I think, uh, I mean, they have, they, they had their lessons learned. Yeah, a long time ago. A long time ago, right? So, I mean, even for me, growing up in Yangon, being a Burma, I felt like I got betrayed, right? By Anneli, Aung San Suu Kyi, yeah, when said, they yeah. were silent about so imagine how ethnic people would feel right i mean to some extent i guess in back in 2015 they might have some sense of hope right i remember i was right? in kachin during the election then and people were very optimistic yeah, yeah. oh yeah Aung San Suu Kyi, i mean yeah she's different from the psychopath you <laughs> so. know the KIO sent her a massive birthday card that year signed by all of the commanders yeah, yeah, so, and then, like, all these uh, women, like, radical women's groups in Azai, they all were advocating for the release of her, you know, like, celebrating all the birthdays mm-hmm. abroad, like, you know, yeah, but then, when she was out, she's completely, she, 
she she doesn't give a fuck about that. No. <laughs> Sadly, and yeah, it was it was very arrogant of her. <laughs> so I mean, Samai, is there any anything else you want to add or any closing thoughts or questions? Um, yeah, no, I was just listening to um, th- everything about the sort of the pessimism and the optimism or whatever. And, you know, I think fundamentally at the end of the day, like, there's going to be people saying it's worth fighting for and you just got to say, I see it too. I, you're a better person than me for actually going for it. But like, um, uh, we can, we can all like look at it kind of, you know, half-heartedly saying, you know, I hope it works, but I know it's probably not going to and be fine with it because, uh, it's just sort of how things are um if you sort of see what i mean very insightful thank you uh. <laughs> <laughs> ouch but no like uh yeah you know you know it's like um you you can you can you, you can just look at systems and you can look at cycles and you can identify that these processes you know they start with this and they 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 go through these stages and they end at that you might be at stage three and you realize well it's probably going to wind up at the end and we're probably not going to have made it anywhere but sometimes things surprise you you know uh and you just gotta hope that something someone does somewhere some group of people makes a change that actually um you know uh moves different parts of the machine in a different way um uh, and, and you know so uh, there's there's some hope there's there's some optimism there and uh, i'm gonna i'm just gonna wrap it up there no i think that's quite nice and it, it reminds me of that thing which is or maybe it's a naruda quote um it, it reminds me of something from the dofa rebellion someone said it was like you know which which by the way was like a a a, a left-wing quite radically feminist um failed revolution in oman and someone said like well yeah okay they all died or went to jail and the revolution was destroyed but like they kind of planted a seed mm-hmm. um which is still alive today and like points to like i don't know rajava and other other movements mm-hmm. like that um so even if this revolution doesn't go the way we want it which is mm-hmm. highly likely like you know long game yeah i mean in Burm- in Burma case, it it will be really a long game, right? And but I think till now we I don't think we haven't really given enough credit of the people on the ground, including those who were first like you know one out on the streets, like all these like factory workers, all these different student groups, all these villagers across the country like young people yeah like especially these working class people yeah right? so we haven't really given enough credit of them that they are really at the front of the revolution so and i myself too like sick of hearing from people like me you know <laughs> like i mean uh hypocrites or elite you know yeah, elite political activists or, you know, talking about, oh, Burma should be like this or we should, yeah, emerging Burmese Bar- society like that or the revolution should be like that or like this. So, yeah, I think now it's time that we really listen to the people on the ground and we have to start thinking about how we can make lives at the margin bring to the center. Mm. So, yeah. All right, let's end it on that note. Um, Chunle, thank you so much. Thank you too. Uh, and yes, uh, to all you listeners, please do not forget to visit dindang.com forward slash support. Um, anything donated there will be very nice. Um, it, that's it, really. Uh, it's on, uh, anonymous as well, so uh, don't worry. There will be nobody knocking at your door. Except for me saying, please, sir, may I have some more? Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's all I have to say. Yeah, um, give us money. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, Shunle will be back in the future, I'm sure. Sure, yeah. And uh, once again, um, whenever that 
podcast that you may start starts we will post links on our social media so okay bye bye folks